do that, I will skip maybe half the questions. I'll, I'll skip all the multiple choice questions and I will, um, oh, I, I don't think I will actually take the time to answer this question other than to say that, um, that these are actually covered in the section. There's even a very nice diagram in uh, section 15.1, which kind of illustrates which type of nuclear radiation with the shielding material that typically stops them. Um, okay, okay. So uh, when you go to this section, section 15.1, uh, it has uh, this diagram of, wait, does it not? Oh, it does not. Um, and okay, okay, I guess this table is sufficient for you to answer the question. The diagram I was thinking of is it's actually in university physics. Um, that's uh, <laughs> the calculus based physics. Uh, let me just show you the diagram. Uh, and, it's, uh, and I'll use that in the lecture in a little bit that's more focused around the radiation safety and uh, being aware of different types of radiation. Almost there, nuclear physics. I think it's under radioactive decay or nuclear. Oh, you know what? I think it's under nuclear reactions. Um, this is the diagram I'm thinking of. It's much more visual, um, alpha, beta, gamma, uh, and with kind of the typical material that stops them. So, uh, so we'll talk about this more in a bit. Uh, let me skip this question <laughs> and go to the... Then let me skip this question as well. If you read the section, and uh, and this uh, diagram actually uh, uh, takes that into account. I mean, you know, it is a schematic diagram, but what they are labeling as alpha has a po four spheres in it because it's trying to illustrate helium four nucleus, two protons, uh, whichever color is proton, protons and two neutrons. And beta is in a different color because it's electron. It's not proton or neutron. And gamma looks like a wavy thing because they are trying to tell you that it's an electromagnetic wave. Um, so let me skip that. Um, I mean, I kind of went over it, but let me not answer it. Um, and this uh, also I will cover in more detail in the proper radiation safety lecture. So. Um, so with the reference to the hint, let me skip that. Um, and I think this is the question where it's um, um, worth staying for a little bit. It, uh, uh, it is not a difficult to question, but it does involve looking up tables that we don't usually do in a physics class. So uh, for those of you who have uh, taken uh, taken chemistry class, and then <laughs> this would be a lot easier. But for those of you who might not remember anything from chemistry class or haven't taken chemistry class. So consulting periodic table is really the biggest thing here. That's the thing that um, kind of requires uh, some level of familiarity. So let me open a periodic table uh, in anticipation of going through this. And um, as I anticipate answering um, this here, What I need to keep in mind is how the information is presented here. So the information that they are giving you is in the form of the isotope specification, helium-4, carbon-12, cobalt-60, cesium-137, uranium-235. The name of the element, helium, carbon, cobalt, cesium, uranium, they tell you in a roundabout way, how many protons there are. The roundabout way being, you have to know what the uh, atomic number of these elements are. Helium, I think a lot of people might know it has atomic number of two, it's right here, that's a helium. Uh, the rest you kind of have to either know or look it up here. Uh, carbon, it has um, abbreviation C. So uh, C is this one here, it has atomic number six. So from looking it up in the periodic table, you can figure out carbon-12 has a six protons. So that's one piece of information. We'll go through all of them. And um, the number tells you it's the um, atomic 
uh, what do they call it? Math, uh, <laughs> called the mass number. And it's the total of protons and neutrons. So once you know the number of protons and the mass number, then you can get the number of neutrons by subtracting the number of protons from the mass number. So six, 12 minus six is six. So, so uh, let me do helium. Four minus two is two, so that's that. The rest, uh, I actually had to look them up because I'm a physicist, not a chemist. I don't know what atomic number cobalt has. So I, I do know it, uh, um, it, it's an acronym um, in the element periodic table. I think it's a CO, so I'm gonna look for CO. So cobalt, um, well, it has to be less than 60. And in fact, uh, usually the stable element isotopes have about equal number of protons and neutrons. So element number of cobalt is gonna be close to 30. Yeah, I see someone saying in the chat, yeah, there it is. <laughs> so close to 30, but not exactly 30. It's not guaranteed. So 27. So that tells us that it has 27 uh, protons and, um, and uh, 60 minus 27, 33 neutrons. And in fact, the rule I was just telling you that stable isotopes have about equal number of protons and neutrons. Those seem to hold for these two. But you will see that as we go to heavier elements, it kind of starts to skew. Uh, cesium, so if I'm going by the rule I was saying, I would expect its atomic number to be around 60, what, 68, 69. And I say it in the chat. <laughs> and you know, if I'm looking it up at uh, 68, oh, 60 something, it's not here. So you know, don't spend too much time looking around here. But as you work your way down, you do find it here. Cesium 55. So this is the part where if you're not used to using periodic table, it might take you some time finding the element. Okay, 137 minus 55. That's I think 82. No. At some point I might use calculator. Could it get embarrassing? <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, uranium 235. Um, no, I said in the chat saying it's 92. Yeah, okay, there it is. <laughs> it, the uranium has the acronym U. Um, so. Um, yeah, and the elements around uranium might sound familiar. Uh, the thorium and, oh, plutonium has two more protons, huh? Somehow I thought plutonium was right above uranium, but I guess it's two above uranium. Anyways, uh, so uranium has 92 protons and uh, you do 235 minus 92, 143 neutrons. And you see that the rule that I was giving you, which was holding well enough here, it starts to shift around here. And around here, it's just completely off. Uranium has 50% more neutrons than protons. It's just, uh, it, uh, it, I think for this class, we don't spend quite enough time in nuclear reactions for me to make a big point out of it. Um, but th there's a fundamental reason for that. There's a, an actual clear pattern that heavier isotopes, stable, stable-ish isotopes do have more neutrons than protons. Okay, let's keep going here. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna need a periodic table later, so I'll just leave it around. Uh, let's keep going. Question five. Um, yeah, let's go through this. This is a multiple answer question. Uh, let me go through, let me first check all the correct choices. Yeah, correct descriptions. And then I will either say, um, yeah, and then I'll add my comments. So all the correct choices. The nuclear force is probably not an inverse of square. It is definitely not an inverse of square. It doesn't behave like an inverse square law force. So I'm gonna leave that alone. It's a stronger than electric force in the nucleus. Yeah, it overcomes Coulomb. Uh, so let me first mark all the correct ones and then make my comment. Okay, so attractive. Um, neither of these are correct. Um, is a short range of force. Is attractive uh, between nucleons, neutrons and protons. Um, does not aid the electric force. It overcomes electric force. So, uh, so let me quickly go through the explanations here. Uh, it so inverse square law force. That's a 
referring to nuclear forces that are not nuclear, that referring to forces that are like uh, uh, these two forces that you have seen. You have seen uh, gravity that has force that goes like uh, some constant times product of masses divided by distances squared or electricity. Uh, so for electric forces, the most clear example that you have seen is Coulomb's uh, law, Coulomb force. And um, it's a little bit harder to see, but uh, magnetic force is also kind of a, like an inverse square law force. So Coulomb force, the electric force looks like some constant times the product of charges divided by, again, distance squared. So those are the inverse square laws that you have seen. And um, without knowing too much about nuclear force, here's something that rules out any consideration of nuclear force as being an inverse square law force. It's the fact that nuclear force is a short range force. It's a inherent feature of inverse square law force, like gravity, that it has, it acts and has influence over long distance scales. Gravity binds the galaxies together. There's a, no longer range of force than gravity. And even though it's harder to see electric forces on the larger astronomical scale, you do definitely see uh, ac action at a distance of an electric force. And so it's an inherent feature. Uh, there's a kind of mathematical detail to that that uh, we won't get into due to time. But um, when, you, when you hear the word inverse square, I want you to think long range. So, so the fact that nuclear force is a short range of force, it rules it out from acting like an inverse square law force without needing to any more detail about it. Okay. And, um, I think uh, to illustrate all these kind of easiest example to look at is the helium nucleus. Uh, that's a kind of simplest, non-trivial uh, nucleus that you have seen. So let me draw my protons. And I, I, don't, I don't have any color scheme here and neutrons. So within the... So, so this is what you might call helium nucleus or helium-4. And within this nucleus, you see the, uh, the contradictions that you're looking for, for the um, statements that are incorrect. Um, so you, here you see that within the helium nucleus, protons and neutrons are bound together. So uh, somehow if there is no attraction between protons and neutrons, then you would see like two protons by themselves and two neutrons by themselves. We don't say that they are all bound into one nucleus. So whatever kind of form nuclear force takes, it's clearly attracted between all constituents of this thing that makes up helium for nucleus. So, um, so, uh, so that helps you roll out this. And the fact that it is stronger than electric force is the arrangement here. Neutrons are like electrically neutral and should play no role in um, um, electrically speaking, in repelling or attracting particles. The only particles with the charges here are protons. They both have positive charges. So they should be repelling each other actually. The fact that they are somehow bound together within atomic nucleus means whatever force is binding them together is stronger than electric force. Maybe not everywhere because it's a short range of force. So there are situations where nuclear force at that range wouldn't be strong enough, but in the nucleus, you can definitely say that, yeah, it's a stronger. Otherwise you wouldn't have helium-4 existing. That's kind of clear proof that it's stronger. Um, let's see, yeah. And is attracted between neutrons and protons probably more or less. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and finally, this is a more of a grammar test than anything else. Um, electric force, because atomic nucleus only contains positive and neutral particles, it um, 
So if electric, if electric force had its way, uh, the atomic nucleus wouldn't exist. So uh, the, the nuclear force is, has to actually overcome that. And if you read the textbook section on nuclear fusion, that's actually one of the things that you have to consider that you need to be able to bring the particles close enough to each other to overcome electric force, get into the range where nuclear force overcomes then uh, repulsive electric force. So. Okay, and, and that's uh, probably all of um, nuclear force that we will cover. I just want you to note that how in discussing nuclear force, we don't have any um, like a mathematical formula that you have seen for gravity and Coulomb force. Um, it's because we frankly don't really have a simple expression for that. I, um, <laughs> Usually in particle physics, they write down something called the Lagrangian, which I'm not going to. And it's kind of out of my depth anyway. I, when I was in physics graduate school, I wasn't a particle physicist. I was an atomic, molecular, and optical physicist. <laughs> there is no simple expression, and there are aspects of nuclear force that we don't fully yet understand. Um, the, so that's why these descriptions are getting at the things that we do know to be true, whatever the, the full expression of nuclear forces, these statements here are all correct. Okay, and, and that's a really, that's a summary of my goal in teaching this class, which is to teach you all the content that I can teach in one semester and avoid teaching anything that's wrong. Uh, because sometimes that kind of happens in these lower, uh, the introductory levels where, you know, for the sake of clarity or whatever, people say something that sounds reasonable for the time being, but actually turns out to be wrong when you are later in graduate school. And, and like, for those of you who might be going on to graduate school in physics, I don't want you to find out later that I told you something wrong in the end. Like, that is one of my actual goals. Okay, uh, he says some medical imaging devices use ionizing radiation while others don't. Uh, choose all medical imaging method below which you, this is a reading check question. Um, so I'll just, uh, you know, read it. I'll just uh, quickly check the answers and tell you what kind of ionizing radiation each one is using. So X-ray imaging does, um, PET scan does, um, uh, CT does. So. Those are the imaging techniques that use ionizing radiation. And it's uh, important uh, to know, particularly those in medical field, because with the imaging techniques that use ionizing radiation, uh, you have to do the cost benefit analysis. The cost is that each of these increases your patient's chance of getting a cancer. That's the cost. <laughs> the benefit is that it might help you diagnose what's wrong with them. So. Um, but like, you know, people shouldn't take x-ray just to cause. <laughs> you should take x-ray when there's a reason for it. Um, so the, the ionizing radiation in each of these categories, with x-ray imaging, it's kind of easy. X-ray itself is ionizing radiation. This is a high energy uh, electromagnetic wave, and uh, it can cause ionization the way UV rays can, X-rays actually just above UV ray in terms of energy. Uh, PET scan is kind of, um, it's got different components. So um, what they use, so positron itself could be considered ionizing radiation because this is an electron antiparticle. So um, if a positron, comes in contact with some matter within your body, in that particular point of contact, it would cause ionization. So positron itself should be considered ionizing radiation. And really what they are looking for in PET scan, to the extent I can understand it, I'm not a medical professional, so I don't work with these devices. Uh, the emission that they are looking for is actually, they are looking for something called a pair annihilation. Oh, how do you spell annihilation? Uh, I hope I spelled it right. A uh, pair annihilation, which is uh, annihilation of the electron and the uh, positron into two photons, two uh, particles of light. It would, uh, um, when they annihilate each other, release the rest energy within their particles, then those go into two photons, two gamma rays, 
And these two high energy photons are themselves ionizing radiation. So uh, oh, so I guess this actually counts as the exact same thing I was calling X-ray, high energy EM wave, that's what gamma rays are. And each of these should have energy of about 0 0.5 MeV. So it's a higher energy than most X-rays. Um, so this also has a chance of causing ionization within your body. Um, computed tomography, this is one you kind of have to read and know because CT scan is basically X-ray scan. It's, uh, I think, uh, to the extent I understand it, it's uh, uh, multiple X-ray scans uh, taken in such a way that, that it allows your medical professional to reconstruct the three-dimensional inside the image. But at the, its core, in terms of physics principles, it's uh, X-ray. So it does the same things that X-ray does, except since it's multiple X-rays, it exposes you to more ionizing radiation. So your doctor will usually consider the cost and benefit before recommending that you get a CT scan. They want just to do it for fun. Um, ultrasound and MRI, uh, both of them. Uh, ultrasound, I mean, unless you consider sound radiation, doesn't use any radiation, although I think it, usually it's in the same department as uh, all these other imaging techniques. MRI is a funny one. I mean, I say funny because in the research setting, it's actually called NMR. Uh, NMR stands for Nuclear Magnetic Resonance. And I guess um, people were getting scared when they hear the word nuclear. So especially in the medical settings, they've just changed the name so that what is actually NMR, they call it M magnetic resonance, and then they just add the I. So, so you know, it should be called the nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. And the reason um, nucle the word nuclear was scaring people unnecessarily is because the kind portion of nucleus that they're using in MRI is uh, what's called a nuclear spin. Um, it's a um, kind of property of a nucleus. It has a, a spin angular momentum. And by interacting with the spin angular momentum using radio frequency waves, you can um, kind of map out where a particular chemical is. Uh, one of the chemicals you can detect is water, which is you know dihydrogen monoxide. It's a kind of a chemical. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it's using a nuclear property, but it has nothing to do with nuclear radiation. It has nothing to do with the scary parts of nucleus. So, okay, so those are the uh, things. And again, this is kind of a reading check question. And um, I think for a lot of people taking this class as a preparation for radiology program, this section is, I think, why they are requiring physics. I mean, you know, your programs will do much more thorough coverage than I possibly can, because again, I'm not a medical professional. But um, I think when they cover it, they don't want you to be seeing this for the first time. They want you to at least have heard about it before coming to their program. Okay, let's uh, wrap this up here. Um, you know, I'm gonna skip this because I want to use our last 20 minutes on talking about radiation safety. And I will actually be covering uh, some of what this question covers. So, you know, you can read it in the section there and I'll also do a kind of the coverage. Oh, I see a question in the chat. Let me just read it out loud and then answer. Uh, quick question on this one, shielding, use of proper material to block radiation where it is not needed or is that even when it, it, where it is not needed or, oh, okay, let <laughs> me read the question. Um, uh, which of the below represents bad methods that are used in practice to limit radiation doses? So shielding should be one of them actually. Um, but yeah, I guess, oh no, this is right. Uh, so let me actually give you the answer first. So the, what I, the phrase I remember is time distance shielding. So let me check those time distance shielding. And then let me make sure that they describe the same thing, reduce the amount of time. So yeah, establish a minimum safe distance. And what shielding means is, so usually um, you have a radioactive thing because you need it. You are using it for some purpose. You don't want to shield it from uh, where you need it. It's like blocking out your camera. You don't want to do that. <laughs> but um, but so but there will be places where you don't need it. You don't need the radiation. So you block the radiation from the places where it's not needed. The rest are not. Uh, and you know this is kind of 
my joke answer. I mean, maybe that happens or happened in the past, but um, that's not a principle of radiation safety. We don't, there are no such things as disposable personnel, and it's not, there aren't supposed to be. Um, um, yeah, we're not living in a video game world. Um, so, and uh, let me, and I'll get more into time. And these actually come in a very specific order, time, distance, or shielding. That's the order in which I remember the phrase, and I'll talk about that in the upcoming lecture. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. So here, let me just check how many questions I have. Okay, uh, let's uh, do that. I will um, check all the correct answers and then briefly explain um, correct and incorrect ones. So um, yeah, both the fission and fusion reactions can release large amounts of energy, especially compared to chemical reactions. And uh, this is incorrect. I'll say later why. Um, uh, this is correct. I think there's a chart in the textbook that actually shows that. Um, yeah, and once that loads, I will show you the chart. Fusion react uh, in the sun, it's a fusion, so this kind of got it backward. And actually, uh, it's not fission reactions. There are nuclear decays within the Earth's core that helps keep Earth's core warm. It's not the only thing, but yeah. Fusion reaction is more likely to take place. Yeah, it is more likely, not guaranteed, but more likely. Uh, while fission reactions are exothermic. <laughs> I think I'm just trying to make it sound scientific without, this is incorrect. Uh, both the fission and fusion reactions obey the, there's no such thing as law of conservation of mass. What we understand is conservation of total energy, including rest energy, uh, which is represented in mass. Both the fission and fusion reactions result in change of element reacting yeah i think that's right um yeah transmutation is uh you have to get the context right because um uh, transmutation is a word you see in the context of alchemy and i don't believe in alchemy <laughs> it's kind of a discredited discipline um, but transmutation does occur in nuclear physics so you just have to make sure you got the context right um so yeah, fusion reactions release energy only for elements lighter than iron. And that's just something that you kind of have to know from your reading. So this is a, a diagram in your textbook that shows what's called the binding energy per nucleon. And it's calculated by, in the way it's described some, well, it's calculated by looking at the difference in the rest energy or mass between what you'd expect from just the number of protons and neutrons and what it actually is for helium-3 and so on. And you see that up to reaching iron here, this uh, binding energy, it goes up, which means, and binding energy is how much less energy there is in the bound thing. So, uh, so as you go from say helium-3 to helium-4, that reaction will, will release energy because the higher amount of binding energy means less energy within that group. So up until reaching iron, uh, as you fuse into heavier atom, it's releasing energy. But after that, uh, as you fuse into more heavier atom, that actually takes energy. And um, astrophysicists believe that all these elements higher than, uh, with the heavier than iron were produced in supernova explosions, uh, which I talk about in my astronomy class. Um, but so yeah, that's the chart that I was referring to. Um, I think the first one is uh, most people get it correct. Uh, here, I think the confusion I was going for is when you look at the description of fusion, there's something called a thermonuclear bomb in the description of fusion bomb. And um, it's called a thermonuclear because the way fusion reaction is triggered, uh, is by ignited is by uh, reaching high enough of a temperature. And, but the reaction itself, I don't know what thermal reaction would even mean. Fusion reaction is a nuclear reaction, just like a fission reaction, as in nuclei are interacting. It's just that with the fusion, certain conditions need to be met. And, um, and in order to meet those conditions, you have to have high enough temperature. That's why the bomb is called a thermonuclear bomb. But I, it, yeah, I don't know what thermal reaction should mean. 
um, talked about that. And this is just kind of got it backwards. I think I mentioned that. Um, um, yeah, it, it's kind of, I think this is evident from here. Um, so if a fission is uh, meant to release energy, it can obviously only happen with the elements that are heavier than iron. And um, most uh, well-known examples are uranium-235 and plutonium-239. Yeah, plutonium-239. Those are, <laughs> that's what to make nuclear bombs out of. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and fission reactions and fusion reactions, both of them, uh, in the for the kinds of reactions we talk about, they both release energy. I mean, I guess uh, you can find the examples of fusion reactions that take energy, like fusion reactions that produce the, all these elements. Sure, but uh, like as a general statement, no. Um, and I think I talked about all of them, so uh, that's good. Let me get to the last question, and I'll just do a quick safety talk that, you know, a lot of you probably won't need, but a lot of you will actually need um, in your profession, uh, expo exposure to ionizing radiation can be occupational hazard, both for researchers and a lot of medical professionals. Um, so, um, <laughs> in particle physics, all particles that make up matter are classified as these. Yeah. Um, I feel like uh, I'm not gonna have enough time to talk about this. Um, let me leave that be, I'll just give you the answers. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a reading check question, so you can read about it here. Cologne is described there. Uh, I'll just give you the answers and we'd not talk about why the answer is the answer. Cologne is a force carrier particle. Neutron is a baryon. Neutrino is a type of lepton. Muon is also a type of lepton. Don't be confused by historical things saying uh, mu meson. It's not a meson, it's a lepton. Sigma is a kind of baryon. Kion is a kind of meson. Uh, pion is a kind of meson. Electron is a kind of lepton. Uh, proton is a kind of baryon. Omega is actually a, it's a historically important baryon. Photon, it's a, a force carrier boson for electromagnetic interaction because it's electromagnetic wave. Um, yeah, so those are the answers. And um, if you are trying to um, see if there's kind of any pattern that helps you match it up to these, the short answer is there's no pattern. I just have this memorized. <laughs> if anyone's ever telling you that you don't have to memorize things in physics or math, ignore them. Um, there's actually a lot of it. I mean, maybe you couldn't quite rely on memorization as much as you might in chemistry or biology or I don't know, any other field where memorization of facts is significant. But the thing is, no matter what the discipline is, um, good memory is always useful. <laughs> and physics is no exception. Um, we do more calculation and stuff, but sometimes like with these, you just have to know them. <laughs> um, I, I like to attach stories to these. Like um, there are great stories about muon, pion, kion, omega, as I was saying. Sigma is the only one that I don't have a good story about, um, but um, in neutrino, there's a great story on that. Um, and which I won't have time to get to. 